the news on your vision tv i am rothy nasije 18 years after uganda attained independence and exactly 18 months after the war that toppled idi amin ended uganda held its first general elections since 1962 on december 10th 1980 as the rest of the world prepared for christmas uganda started preparing for the five-year bush war in which half a million people about five percent of the population perished. In this 13-part series, New Vision takes you through the dark period which ended up rewriting the country's history. Uganda's first post-independence general election of December 10, 1980 came after several shocks and twists. When Amin was overthrown in April 1979 by Tanzania's army, barking Ugandan exiles, the jubilation was short-lived for his replacement. Professor Yusuf Lule was removed in a palace school two months later. Lule's replacement, Godfrey Binaisa, rushed to entrench a movement structure of government the non-partisan Uganda National Liberation Front and started arranging elections which he was poised to win as he tried to lock out ex-president Milton Obote who had spent almost a decade in exile in Tanzania and on whose friendship President Julius Nyerere had partly based his support for Ugandan exiles seeking to overthrow Idi Amin. As the president was consolidating his position by knocking powerful soldiers like defense Minister Yoweri Museveni, who he demoted to the insignificant portfolio of regional affairs, Internal Affairs Minister Paul Mwanga, who he demoted to the Labour portfolio, and Army Chief General Oyite Ojok, who he tossed to Algeria as Ambassador Binaisa was overthrown in May 1980 and placed under house arrest. Preparations for the elections continued, but after taking an entirely different turn. With the troublesome Godfrey Binaisa safely under lock and key somewhere in Entebbe, Paolo Mwanga assumed the office of head of state and declared the return of Malt Party politics to Uganda as chairman of the military commission. Yoweri Museveni bounced back as vice chairman and, in effect, vice president. Curiously, Paul Mwanga and his namesake, Paul Semogere of the Democratic Party, hardly agreed to the killing of the non-partisan UNLF and started competing on party lines in readiness for the elections later that year of 1980. Semogere had earlier petitioned court challenging the removal of President Yusuf Ulule. He was to win the case later, but the ruling had obviously been overtaken by events and Lule was living out the balance of life in exile in England. General Yite Ojok also resumed his powerful military job. The fall of Binaisa in May 1980 opened war for what a section of Ugandans had feared most, the return of the ex-president Milton Obote. On May 27th that year, Obote returned to Uganda through the west of the country, his light aircraft from Tanzania landing at Bushenyi, where he had a lot of support outside his Lango home in northern Uganda. What the anti-Obote groups had feared most became obvious when the interim government seemed to go on all fours before him. Paul Mwanga himself was referred to more by official media as vice president of the UPC, Obote's party, than that as head of state. It was clear who the boss was. In fact, Mwanga started representing his party boss Obote at some public party functions. Obote was of course enjoying support of his old friend Julius Nyerere, whose army was effectively in charge of Uganda. It was such an obviously skewed atmosphere that other old parties and new ones were to compete with the UPC, which was already acting like it was above the state.
When the military commission led by Paolo Mwanga and Yuri Museveni overthrew President Godfrey Vinaisa, preparations for multi-party elections kicked off immediately. In the second part of our series on the election that brought war instead of peace, New Vision TV brings you the parties that contested the polls that ended in bloodshed. When he took office as president in mid-June 1979, Lawyer Godfrey Vinaisa did not waste time to start consolidating his position. He streamlined the ruling Uganda National Liberation Front into a robust vehicle to propel himself to electoral victory, determined to lock out ex-president Milton Obote, who was still in Tanzania. When the military commission overthrew Vinaisa in May 1980, its chairman and the head of state, Paolo Mwanga, hastened to arrange the return of Obote who was president and founder of the UPC party. Obote arrived the same month and started campaigning. Dr. Paolo Mwanga, who was interim leader of the Democratic Party since the earlier killing of its charismatic leader, Benedicto Chwanka, by the Amin regime, also supported the end of the UNLF and started campaigning. The DP tried to Yoram Seveni, a southerner with military credit in a country where the army was still a preserve of the northern region. But Museveni shunned the old parties, which he saw as sectarian, and formed his the Uganda Patriotic Movement, which he led with Bidan Sali as Secretary General and his de facto number two. Former Uganda Katikilo, Jowashi Mayanja Nkanji, also formed the Conservative Party, seen as a new name for Kabakaika, the de facto and short-lived monarchist Kabakaika party of the early 60s. When the four parties to contest the election identified, a realignment of forces started taking place. The UPC of Milton Obote and head of state Paolo Mwanga suffered most defections, despite it enjoying advantages of de facto incumbency. Big names that deserted Obote included his cousin Adok Nekion, who joined the the DP. Many leaders who had been in UPC in the 60s did not want to be associated with its record that included abolition of kingdoms, banning of political parties, and giving rise to the destructive Idi Amin and joined other parties. The DP was a major beneficiary and it had vested many new members. Most conservative Baganda who had been with Kabaka Eka in the 60s went to DP. Disillusioned UPC also went to DP. The populous religion of Buganda and Basoga were poised to vote in mass for DP. A tricky situation emerged for the DP when former President Yusuf Le started making plans to return home and contest in the elections. Elule candidature was guaranteed to arouse the ethereal of two months presidency, which was seen by many as paradise coming a minis eight role. But if Le took the DP nomination from Samuel Gedele, he would likely alienate many supporters outside Buganda, which was seen as conservative, unlike Samuel Gedele with broader appeal. DP's dilemma was solved by UPC's head of state, Paolo Mwanga, who simply blocked Tule from returning to Uganda, accusing him of disrespecting Tanzania's president, Julius Nyerere. Museveni's UPM was an idealistic party and it attracted many educated youth from the city and institutions of higher learning. Its main organizer was Bidandi Sali, a popular city politician, one-time manager of the national soccer site, The Cranes, and publisher of the influential weekly topic newspaper. Older people who did not want to associate with the old parties also joined UPM. These included Dr. Samson Kiseka, lawyer Sam Unjuba, Kirunda Kivei Jinja, and Chintu Musoke. The Conservative Party was created by former Katiki it was by far the smallest as it was an effect of regional party, despite having a secretary general from outside Buganda at the time. The party all the same made a statement of people exercising their right of association and identifying with their origins. 
Although there were four parties in the 1980 elections, the real contest was between Samogere's DP and Obote's UPC, which enjoyed the support of President Paulo Mwanga and Tanzania's Julius Nyerere. In the third part of our series on the election that brought war instead of peace, New Vision TV brings you the contentious issues that remained sticky during the campaigns until the elections that ended in bloodshed. Now, when the military commission led by UPC strongman Paul Mwanga declared the 1980 campaign season open, top contender Paul Kawanga Semoge of the DP immediately discovered the ground was far from being leveled. When Paolo Semogheredi announced that the DP had decided to adopt a positive attitude towards the military commission for the sake of having a peaceful election, the government allowed the DP and all parties to campaign freely. The DP attracted mass support and a euphoric atmosphere engulfed all the rallies like they were celebrating victory. But when they started asking certain safeguards against rigging, they realized the election was not going to be free and fair. So they listed what they considered the minimum conditions for the election to be acceptable, which they lodged with the Electoral Commission. The DP demanded that instead of having separate ballot boxes for the different parties, there should be only one box for all at every polling station. The DP also demanded that counting be done on the spot at every polling station that same day, instead of transporting the ballot filled boxes to the district for counting. But the military commission did not see these safeguards as important enough, and Semogerede had to appeal to the real power, Tanzania's president. So as the campaigns progressed, Semogede found himself flying to Dar es Salaam once every week. Although Nyerere gave him audience, there was little evidence that the Dar es Salaam trips yielded any results. The campaigns progressed, with the DP apparently gathering more support, but the UPC virtually enjoying all the advantages of incumbency. Although UPC candidate Milton Obote was not yet president, he was clearly behaving like the boss, sending the head of state Mwanga to represent him at rallies. The army was also intimidating DP supporters. Now, your M7 of the new small UPM was already saying that if UPC steals the election, he would go to the bush and fight, to which the UPC scoffed that they would follow them to the bush and leave them there. The leader of the other small party, Mayanji Ankanji of the CP, a small-bodied man with a small voice, cut a comical figure whenever he promised to do things when the CP goes to power. Milton Obote would write call him asking whether people are serious when the CP also starts talking about going to power, which he pronounced as Pewa. When it became obvious that there would be no safeguards against rigging, Samoge started saying that if the UPC stole the election, God would see them. So in charge was the UPC that even the government newspaper Uganda Times was acting like a party mouthpiece. UPC caused an uproar when they ran a lead headline saying a million in Kumi to describe a small rally that Obote had addressed in the town. The Times would run headlines insulting candidate Museveni, who was already seen as a threat because of his militancy. The government broadcasters Radio Uganda and Uganda Television kept announcing casually that Obote would address a mammoth crowd at a given place even before anybody assembled there. During nominations of parliamentary candidates, the army brutally attacked areas not seen to support UPC. In the West Nile region, the government army simply conducted a genocide, killing everybody who did not flee the country fast enough to Sudan and Congo. The region, being Idi Amin's home, was not expected to vote for UPC, and so the army decided it wouldn't have anybody to vote or to be voted for. All DP and other aspirants were arrested or blocked from seeking nominations, and the UPC was given all the seats in West Nile unopposed. Such was the situation in which the Ugandans went to the polls on December 10th, 1980, with everything in favor of the UPC except the millions of DP voters. But did the voters matter anyway?
Now, in our fourth part on the election that brought war instead of peace, New Vision TV takes you back to probably the darkest December in Uganda's history. After spending most of the second half of 1980 haggling over election mechanics between Dr. Kawanga Semogere's DP and the ruling military commission of UPC strongman Paolo Mwanga, the long-awaited day of December 10th finally arrived. Now, Ugandans all over the country except West Nile, where the entire population had been driven into exile, turned up enthusiastically to vote. As the polling progressed, with indications that the DP could be headed for victory, Paolo Mwanga suddenly changed the rules, setting the stage for a bloody civil war that cost half a million lives or nearly 5% of the population. Millions of Ugandans everywhere, except West Nile, turned up on December 10th, 1980, to vote for the four contesting parties. Milton Obote's UPC, Kawanga Semogeli's DP, Yoweri Museveni's UPM, and Mayanja Nkanji's CP. The elections were on parliamentary basis, meaning that the party with most seats would form government and its leader would become president. There was no direct direct presidential election as is known today. Obote even refused to stand for any constituency, but Samogere stood in Busiro South, which also covered Entebbe Town. This provoked Obote for being a coward, saying that had he been man enough, they should have tussled it out in Entebbe, where he had lived before at State House, and the residents knew what kind of person he was. Museveni stood in Mbara North, where he was to lose to DP's Sam Kotesa. Ex-president Godfrey Binaisa was still in detention, but he had joined UPM and they picked a university graduate student to represent him in Nakawa, then called Kampala East, where he was to be defeated by DP's Ojok Molozi. As counting of the votes got underway, it appeared like the DP was going to win with a landslide. But this was still an impression, with no solid evidence for the real victory. The first results to reach different party headquarters were from the central region, and the DP had swept all the seats in Buganda, a quarter of the total number of 126 constituencies. Celebration started. Obote's cousin, Alhaj Akba Adoko Nikon, was the Mugere's number two and seated at the balcony of the DP headquarters on William Street. He kept tossing papers of the results to the crowds. Although he went by the Islamic title of Alhaji, Nikon was clearly intoxicated with something known so holy. As excitement over DP's presumed victory grew, the head of state, Paolo Mwanga, issued a chilling proclamation. As chairman of the military commission, Mwanga vested in himself the sole power to declare election results for all constituencies. And but whether electoral commission or party official who dared announce any results would automatically face five years imprisonment and or a fine of half a million shillings, which at today's value would amount to 25 billion shillings. Suddenly, the city streets were taken over by a heavy deployment of the military, both Tanzanian and Ugandan. A dark cloud descended over Kampala and many parts of the country. As Mwanga took over the powers of the Electoral Commission, he started announcing the results in a slow motion, constituency by constituency. The UPC had a head start of nearly 20 unopposed seats. After some interesting cases where a few constituencies initially won by the DP and where the UPC losers had considered defeat were re-announced as having been won by the UPC, Milton Obote was poised to become president of Uganda for the second time. And Miri Obote was also set to become a second time first lady. Obote was swiftly sworn in and Mwanga handed over power to his party boss. The UPC can thus argue that contrary to popular claims that Uganda has never had a peaceful transfer of power, it actually happened in December 1980. 
at the swearing in, the country was shocked to see Mwanga smile in public for the first time. With many saying the election was stolen, imagine what happened next. Many Ugandan students or journalists who in recent years were selected to observe elections, say of the United States, would be shocked to learn the importance Ugandans attached to the so-called Commonwealth observers who came to observe the 1980 December 10th elections while parties and uh, the UPC were saying elections were rigged. Everyone waited for the final verdict from the Commonwealth observer team as if it really mattered that much. As Milton Obote saw in to become president of Uganda for the second time in his life, the country waited for three important reactions. First was that of Paulo Semogerere, the man widely believed to have won the elections. Second was that of Yoram Museveni, vice chairman of the military commission and leader of Uganda patriotic movement, who had vowed to go to the bush if the election was rigged. Third was the report of the Commonwealth observer team. Ugandans were then still relatively unschooled in diplomaties. Many had expected the Commonwealth team to issue a clear-cut verdict, like a judge in court who says either guilty or innocent. But instead of the Commonwealth observers saying the election was either free and fair or reached, they released a lengthy, widening document that disappointed the eager audience. Many Ugandans were opposed to Obote and his UPC thus went for Christmas in a state of confusion and disillusionment. The Commonwealth observers dwelt on the stunning success of a country which had had its systems broken down by the military regime for almost a decade being able to organize such a modern election. The Commonwealth observers were also impressed that with poor logistics like transport and communication, the country had been able to distribute voting materials to all corners in time. The observers were also impressed that millions had gone to the polling stations and cast their ballots without being prevented by the government forces. So the Commonwealth observers concluded in that language, which now most African countries are familiar with, that given the circumstances, the elections were held in at a relatively acceptable standards, and that by and large, the results to a large extent reflect the general will of the electorate, and so on, and so forth. Now, after the UPC and Milton Obote were declared winners of the 1980 election and even the Commonwealth observers endorsing the process, different Ugandans took different routes, starting with the sixth segment of our past elections series. New Vision TV traces the key players and what became of them in the aftermath. We begin with the man who many claim was the rightful winner, Paulo Kawanga Semogerere. It is not debatable that Paul Kawanga Semogere enjoyed massive support with his Democratic Party in the 1980 election campaigns, virtually sweeping all the seats in the central region and Kampala City. When the final results that were unexpected and unacceptable, especially in the central, were announced, the nation held its breath, awaiting his next course of action. Would he reject the results as announced by the military commission that had usurped the role of the electoral? Commission. In a disappointing surprise, his supporters, Semo Gay announced that the DP was going to parliament as opposition. The DP went into opposition with the UPC in government. The seats for military representatives were introduced, nominated by the president. The most powerful man in the army then, Major General Oyite Ojok, symbolically sat with the opposition on their benches. President Obote straight away embarked on ridiculing Dr. Semogere at every opportunity. Semogere and his part diligently led the opposition until one time in protest against the massive human rights abuses led an opposition walkout at the presentation of the budget presented by President Obote, who was also finance minister. Arrogant with his party's numerical strength in parliament, Obote scoffed at him, saying he was not bothered by a few walkouts. 
Fed up with the existing insults, leader of opposition in parliament, Paul Semogere, announced that he had started compiling a black book of those who were abusing Ugandans' rights. That did it. The military and UPC leaders were furious at the implication that a time for paying for their sins would come. But all the same, they drastically cut down on the arrogance, though they could not contain the excesses of their army. At least the rest of Obote's time was spent without the original arrogant attitude. As the bush war waged by the NRA rebels gathered momentum, it looked like indeed a time for punishment would eventually come. In July 1985, Obote was overthrown the second and last time. This time, it was a faction of the army led by Basilio Okello and Tito Okello. The military junta was forced to enter peace talks with the NRA rebels in Nairobi, chaired by President Daniel Arap Moy. DP men Kawanga Semoge and Sam Kutesa were with the military government. So was UPC's Olaro Tun, who had served as Uganda's representative to the UN. When the angry young guerrilla leader Yoweri Museveni arrived at the Nairobi peace talks, he refused to greet the military government delegation except only Kawanga Semogere, whom he reached for across the table and shook his hand. The peace agreement collapsed and the NRA shot into power, chasing away the Okelos. However, DP's Paul Semogere joined the broad-based interim government of President Museveni in which he served for nearly 10 years, internal affairs, and later as foreign affairs minister. In internal affairs, he worked with Kiza Besje, who was the minister of state. In 1989, Semogere stood for the Busiro South seat in the extended interim parliament called National Resistance Council. In 1995, he resigned from Seven's cabinet, where he held the foreign affairs portfolio in readiness to stand in the country's first direct presidential elections of 1996. He wound up as the runner-up and remained as DP leader. When the parties were freed in the 2005 referendum, he surrendered the DP leadership to Seva Nachizito. Throughout his service as minister under the NRM, Semoge is easily recognized as having the cleanest financial record as minister, but opinions are divided whether his cleanliness served the Democratic Party as an advantage. Will men of his integrity one day be in charge of the country's politics? Now, after Bote sworn in as president, following the disputed December 1980 election, he faced the most troubled term of office that finally ended in another coup and final exile. In this series on the election that plunged Uganda into war, New Vision TV traces of Bote's career and life after he took office for the second and last time. After Bote took office in December 1980, trouble started as angry Ugandans took the bush to fight him. There was Andrew Takomwe Kaira, a criminology PhD and former Minister of Internal Affairs who formed the Uganda Freedom Movement. His daring guerrillas drew fast blood and even attacked the biggest military establishment in the city, the Lubiri, using mortar pieces at Rubaga Cathedral Hill. But the UFM was not so great on discipline and though it rattled the government, it could not dislodge it so fast. There were other cowboy guerrilla bands including Kakoza Mutales. Even Kahin Kindo Tafiri had gone to the bush but quickly joined the Oweri Museveni's force like Kakoza Mutali did. Rattling the Obote government militarily was not so hard because he was busy padding the government army, the UNLA, with tribesmen from Acholi and Nango so fast that many of them lacked adequate training. Men as old as 60 years and boys in their teens were being put in uniform and called NYS, not yet approved. Despite having real generals at the top like Oite Ojok, the UNLA was hopeless on ground. Besides the rebels who were harassing the police and army units to collect guns, Obote had a hard time dealing with the economy. He had named himself Minister of Finance and quickly ran to the IMF and World Bank for funding, but this had to come with conditionalities of restructuring. It was a time of gambling for him. The shilling deteriorated to an unprecedented levels. On 2nd December 1983, a military helicopter exploded in the air over Luero and among the dead on board was Chief of Staff Major General Yite Ojok. 
From that moment, it was all downhill for Milton Obote's career because he had relied so much on Oyite Ojok. The army was predominantly a Choli, but Obote needed to replace Oyite Ojok with a fellow Langi, so his appointment of Brigadier Smith upon a chuck made matters worse. The Acholi, who regarded the army as theirs, decided to overthrow Obote and led by Basidi Okello and Tito Okello on July 27, 1985, took over power. Overthrown in July 27, 1985, Obote fled by road to Kenya, penniless. From Nairobi, he proceeded to Zambia, where his old friend, President Kenneth Kaunda, offered him sanctuary. Tanzania could not take him as Nyerere was leaving power and in any case, he was no longer worn to Obote following his overindulgence with alcohol, according to Nyerere's own words when he visited Uganda later. When Kaunda lost power in an election, Obote had to remain very quiet as a condition for his continued stay in Zambia. Journalists who visited him in Lusaka were shocked at the abject poverty the two-time president of Uganda was living in, often sharing cigarettes with his son. In October 2005, Milton Obote fell sick and was taken to a Johannesburg hospital where he died. His body was returned to Uganda where he was accorded the honors of a former head of state. Obote's wife and two-time first lady, Miria Karure, was nominated as UPC's presidential candidate in the 2006 election. She dutifully campaigned and was one of the several runners-up. His son, Jimmy Akena, went to parliament and is still there. His daughter-in-law is now minister of lands. Obote was a political survivor and his children are still high-ranking in the country. Will one of them rise to state house one time? The only man to wield as much presidential power in Uganda as Idi Amin was Paolo Mwanga, who from May to December 1980 led the country with an iron hand until he handed over power to his party leader, Milton Obote. In this series on the election that ended in bloodshed, New Vision TV follows Paolo Mwanga until his death. Although many people knew Paolo Mwanga as a tough, no nonsense man. He still surprised the world when from a lowly position of chairman of one of the several commissions of the post Amini government, he sacked President Godfrey Binaisa in 1980 and started organizing elections. Then he surpassed even his enemy's wildest expectations when on the election day he took over the powers of the electoral commission to announce the results. After giving the victory to his friend and party chairman Chairman Milton Obote. Their pal Major General Oyita Ojok joked at the swearing in ceremony that Mwanga was now a man without a job. Mwanga smiled in public for the first time since he had taken power. After Obote assumed office for the second time, he named Mwanga as his vice president and also gave him the powerful portfolio of defense minister. As the UPC government suffered internal tribal divisions, in the army between Acholi and Langi, Mwanga started building what was unofficially known as UPC Buganda. Towards the end of the UPC government, there was a fierce battle between the army factions in the city, and as military and state officials fumbled with an explanation, Mwanga famously described the battle as uncoordinated troop movement. Finally, the army overthrew the government, and to everybody's surprise, the vice president and defense minister was named as prime minister of the new government. The new government of General Tito Kelo knew that they could not contain Yoweri Museveni's guerrilla national resistance army that made more gains while the tribal factions of the army fought each other and was now controlling a large part of Uganda's territory. The Okelos sued for peace and President Arab Moy started organizing to mediate 
the two parties in Nairobi. But the NRS set as a first condition the removal of Mwanga from prime ministership before they could even consider joining the talks. So after just a month in office, Paolo Mwanga lost the high position of prime minister, which was then given to Abraham Waligo, an engineer with a clean record. After the Nairobi peace agreement collapsed and NRA captured power in January 1986, Mwanga remained a free man for about 10 months. Then he was arrested and detained. In prison, he met an old friend, Israel Mayengo, with whom they shared a cell. Mayengo had been an ally of Yuri Museveni and still swears he doesn't know why the NRA government detained him without trial for a year. Mwanga and Mayengo had worked together clandestinely in the 70s, both financing the anti Amin military and diplomatic struggles. Mwanga had been Uganda's ambassador to France for six years until the early 70s and had remained in Europe, mobilizing against Idi Amin. Mayengo, a prosperous businessman, had later worked with Mwanga buying arms and recruiting anti Amini soldiers. Meeting in prison, they reforged their friendship, and in their cell, Mwanga surprised Mayengo by telling him that he would be released after one year, and he, Mwanga, would be staying on for another full year before being released. Mwanga's prediction of the time he and Mayengo would spend in detention passed exactly as he said, and he was released in 1988. But he was rearrested and detained again in 1989. In 1990, he fell critically ill and was released so as to access quality medical treatment. Mwanga had in the 60s met at several young politicians who had grown significantly in status. They included the Troika of Bidandi Sali, Kintu Musoke, and Kirunda Kizei Jinja, who were then already in Museveni's government. The three had refused to rejoin UPC when Amin fell, and instead joined Yuri Museveni in 1980 to form the Uganda Patriotic Movement. These three organized to fly Mwanga, their mentor, to an Nairobi hospital where he spent his final days. He died in April 1991, aged 70. Mwanga is remembered for making it possible for Bota to become president for a second time. Will history condemn or credit him for this? Of the four candidates in the 1980 election that plunged Uganda into war, the most polished of them was no doubt Josh Mayajankanji, who had even once served as Prime Minister of the ancient Buganda Kingdom before its abolition 14 years earlier. New Vision TV now traces in Kanji's life after the fateful elections. As the last Prime Minister of the ancient Buganda Kingdom, which was militarily destroyed on his watch, Mayajankanji had possibly been at the receiving end of the worst political crisis than any other Ugandan. This could explain why he managed to live peacefully in Uganda from 1971 when he returned to bring the border of his Kabaka, Edward Mutesa, through all the successive governments until he died in 2017, aged 85. At the fall of Binaisa in mid 1980, Manjang Kanji formed the Conservative Party to contest the December general elections. A lawyer and economist trained both in Makere and Oxford in England, Manjang Kanji had a clear manifesto proposing a federal system of government, but hardly anybody paid attention in a post atmosphere where federation was instinctive quitted to Buganda supremacy. His party was the butt of jokes. His poorly attended campaign rallies at which an old man in Akanzu carried the candidate's documents in a size of bag, inspiring ridicule and UPC candidate Milton Obote used to ask whether the people were serious, if even the CP can talk of going to power. The CP did not win a single seat in the December 1980 election, but Inkanji had made his point that believing the order of unity in diversity is a right that should not be criminalized. After the elections ended and the civil war started, Nkanji, who had lived peacefully under Amin as a 
commercial lawyer, continued with his life practicing in Kampala as an advocate of the High Court. When the Okelos overthrew Obote mid 1985, Nkanji was named to cabinet as Minister of Labor. The Okelo government fell in January 1986, and the new president, Yoel Museven, appointed Nkanji Minister of education. One of Nkanji's first achievements then was the expansion of higher education beyond the single university of Makere to add Chambogo and Mbarara. After education, Nkanji moved to economic planning where he oversaw the diversification of the economy and promotion of the private sector, including the creation of Uganda Investment Authority. Finally, President Museveni appointed Nkanji the full minister of finance and economic planning, a portfolio he held for most of the 90s, during which Museven would proudly describe him as a conservative turned revolutionary. Nkanji presided over the implementation of many liberal economic policies. Leaving cabinet in 2001, Nkanji became chairman of the Uganda Land Commission, holding the position for some 12 years. While he was seen as a decent individual, a lot of the mess in lands occurred under his watch. This was obviously due to his leave and let leave policy, as he did not do enough to stop the abuse and grabbing of public lands during his tenure. When he died in 2017 at the age of 85, most eulogies emphasized his humility. After surviving the worst political crisis in Uganda's history, Nkanji lived at peace under all the successive turbulent systems, and his survival was attributed to humility and obedience. While it helped to live to a ripe old age and see great grandchildren, does anybody consider it a record to be proud of? Of the four parties that contested in Uganda's 1980 elections, the DP had most to lose or to gain. When they lost, their mass of supporters who believed victory was theirs were thrown into disarray. As their candidates went into parliament to play Fido, they were left without leadership. New Vision TV traces what came of the millions of DP supporters. Following Mwanga's usurping of the Electoral Commission's role of announcing results, and declaring his UPC party the winner, many believed the DP's victory had been stolen. As one scholar, Mahmoud Mamdani put it, the DP failed to translate victory into power. So its leader, Dr. Paolo Kawanga Samogerere, went into parliament as leader of opposition, leading some 50 MPs. For nearly five years, the MPs suffered humiliation at the hands of UPC leaders and activists, but some of them put up a spirited fight against UPC's excesses. These were Samogerere himself and others like Mbara North MP, Sam Kutesa. But many succumbed to the intimidation and all the Busoga MPs who had been voted as DP cross to UPC, except one professor, Yoweri Chesimir, who was imprisoned until the overthrow of a vote in July 1985. The DP had an affiliate foundation, the Foundation for African Development, FAD. It did some civic mobilization and kept identifying young DP supporters and helped some get scholarships. The DP also published a daring newspaper, The Citizen, whose editor, Anton Sechema, suffered constant physical assault and torture by government forces, and many printers were intimidated from printing the newspaper. Finally, The Citizen was printed using manual typewriters and copies run of cyclostyling machines. Many disappointed DP supporters who had been in the mood to resist the UPC government in some form of civil action were confused when their leader Samogele humbly went into parliamentary opposition. They started going to the bush to follow their militaristic member, Dr. Andrew Takome Kaila, who had once served as a minister in the short-lived Yusuf Lule government. Others looked for other fighting groups, particularly the People's Redemption Army, PRA, of Yorim 7, which was later to be 
become NRA after joining with Yusuf Lee's supporters. There were also others who joined the Federal Democratic Movement, or FEDEMO. Many other DP supporters resigned to a life of terror under the new government. Those in districts around Kampala that came to be known as the Luera Triangle abandoned the normal life in the countryside and fled to Kampala, starting the concept of internally displaced people. Kampala became congested as entire previously wealthy families rented garages. The breakdown of services and sanitation infrastructure was virtually complete. Many with enough education fled to other countries to start new lives, as partially economic refugees. As the guerrilla war put the UPC government under pressure, the tribal crack in the army between Acholi and Langi widened. The Acholi soldier gravitated towards the DP and finally, when they overthrew Bote, they appointed more DPs in the government, which ruled for six months. When your M7 is NRA took power in 1986, it was very positive to the DP. Some positions went to the DP, and this included internal affairs for Semogerere and finance and Posiano Mulema. Kafumbe Mkasa also remained in finance until he died in 1994. But some DPs were not too keen to join NRM's broad base and formed what they called DP mobilizers. They had early run-ins with the police, which ironically fell under Semogerere's docket. When the constitution was being concluded in 1995 to pave way for the 1996 elections, Kawanga Semogere jumped out of NRM broad-based government to prepare to challenge Museveni for presidency. The DP entered a previously unimaginable alliance with the UPC in a bid to dislodge Museveni. It never succeeded. The head of the team that fought Museveni in 1996, Miriam Mutagamba, quickly joined Museveni's movement and remained there as minister for two decades. After the 2005 referendum, Samoge relinquished DP leadership to Sevana Chizito, who was among the losers of the 2006 elections. No, but Mao took over and was one of the losers of the 2011 elections. The DP had been sharply divided between Maui supporters and those of Kampala Lord Mayor Arias Lukwago. In 2016, DP couldn't even field a presidential candidate, and Mao campaigned for Amama Mbabazi, while Lukwago campaigned for Kiza Besije. Other top DPs were shared almost equally between Besije and Mbabazi. The DP's capacity to raise a presidential figure keeps diminishing, though the party seems to be gaining on the ground in terms of more members of parliament in successive elections. The party has been courting anti seven strong personalities, from military maverick David Sejusa to musical legislator Robert Chagulanyi. As the clock ticks 2020-21, will the DP manage to find a strong candidate before presidential nominations in 2020? The Uganda People's Congress Party was declared winner of the 1980 elections and their problems started immediately. New Vision TV traces UPC's problems that dog it it even after it lost power to this day. As soon as the UPC was declared winner of the December 1980 elections, the stage was set for civil war as the results were widely disputed. Milton Obote was sworn in as president while angry Ugandans started going to the bush to start waging a guerrilla war against his government. Obote formed an apparently competent non-secretarian government with the economics cabinet portfolios going to people from the western region. But the public was not impressed and started supporting the insurgents in the bush. The insurgents kept attacking police stations to grab weapons. The UPC government failed to control the army which routinely terrorized the people to roll and rape. As the situation deteriorated, the Tanzanian army started pulling out and recruitment of more Ugandans just worsened the indiscipline of the soldiers. The UPC government brought in North Koreans to support the army, but the insurgents were getting more serious. Then one day in December 1983, the army chief of staff, Major General Oyite Ojok, died in a helicopter crash. 
UPC's fall became inevitable. The death of Oito Jokes the affected President Milton Obote, who had relied on him to hold the army together. Obote's use of alcohol reportedly intensified. The army was heavily a choli, but Obote could not appoint an acholi to replace Oyita Ojuk. Finally, he appointed another Langi, Smith Opon Achak, who was unacceptable to their choli soldiers. Meanwhile, the economy continued to deteriorate despite the return of the World Bank and IMF with their recovery policies. The army became more wild, and one time, President Obote, who appeared to be drunk, pleaded with the army to ask for any amount of money from him, since he was also finance minister, but to leave him in power. But the actually soldiers seemed to prefer the power and to be in charge of the money as well. They overthrew him and he fled to Zambia. The overthrow of UPC did not end its challenges. For the immediate, many of its supporters, especially in Lango, were targeted in revenge of the new military government that took power from July 1985. The military strongmen relied heavily on Ambassador Olara Otunu, who relocated from the UN to lend them his political brain. Some suspected Otunu of converting the presidency that they actually generals would willingly transfer to him. When they were eventually overthrown after six months, Otun returned abroad and to his UPC party. When the NRM formed its broad-based government, the UPC members shunned it but participated in the first post obote parliamentary elections of 1989 to join the movement, no party legislature, where they put up a spirited opposition to the executive. UPC luminaries in the National Resistance Council included Yona Kanyomozi and Adonia Tiberondwa. The UPC remained organizationally strong and its de facto leader in the country was Mama Cecilia Ugual, its substantive deputy secretary general then. She remained in touch with the exiled Obote who was in Lusaka and kept the party cohesive even as the parties were under strict restriction. The UPC in fact effectively organized Semogated his 1996 presidential bid as his own DP was effectively finished in the countryside. The UPC is believed to have advised its supporters to preserve themselves and remain out of arm by avoiding armed confrontation with the NRM. Thus, the UPC distanced itself from rebellion and saved many Langi lives as their children were caught up in the destructive 20 years insurgency of Uganda People's Democratic Army, Alice Lakwena's Holy Spirit Movement, and Joseph Kony's Lord's Resistance Army. Cecilia Ogwal even turned down an offer to become Uganda's first woman vice president. The 1995 constitution was promulgated and it put an edge limit on presidential candidates of 75 years. Milton Obote, in whom UPC supporters believed spiritually, was then 70 years and would become ineligible in 2000. It is believed that many delegates in the Constituent Assembly could not stomach an election in which Obote was a candidate and after 2000, the age limit would be unnecessary, according to the dominant thinking in 1995. Even then, Obote remained extremely influential in the party until his death in 2005. After the death of Obote in 2005, the UPC went into free fall. For the 2006 elections, the party just fielded Obote's widow, Miria Kalule, who had no political background whatsoever. In fighting in the party, so the woman who had kept UPC alive and active during Obote's exile, Cecilia Ogwal, sidelined. She quit the party and joined FDC of Dr. Kiza Besije. For the 2011 elections, UPC fielded Olara Otunu, a presidential candidate who did not even bother to go and vote for himself. In a few years that followed, Otunu was involved in endless bitter disputes for party leadership with Obote's son, Jimmy Akena. And before 2016, Otunu was beaten up and thrown out of the headquarters at Uganda House by 
by party use. In the 2016 elections, UPC could not even field a presidential candidate, and party chief Aken advised the party supporters to vote for any candidate of their choice. The UPC has a temporary problem of lacking a leader of presidential sitacha, with its party president, Akena, seen as too cozy with the ruling NRM. Will they find a suitable candidate for 2021 by presidential nomination time in 2020? As we approach the end of our series on the 1980 election that plunged the country into war, with a look at the key personalities that participated, we now come to candidate Yoram Museveni, the man who led Uganda patriotic movement. What did he do after the December 10th election? New Vision TV summarizes Museveni's post-election struggle. The UPM leader, who was also the vice chairman of the military commission that organized the 1980 election, had been warning that she did be rigged, who would go to the bush and wage war against the fraudulent government that would be installed. And since the ground was blood and shame, even in favor of the UPC, it was just a matter of waiting for December for the war to start. By the end of January 1981, preparations for war were almost ready, and the final meeting to plan the attack was held in the Makinde residence of Matthew Rukikayure on February 3rd. The modern seven chose was of a homegrown people's protracted war rather than one supported from outside. On February 6th, he led 40 men, who included intelligence officer Paul Kagame, former art teacher Eli Tumwine, a young experienced fighter, Fred Rijema, and they had only 27 guns. They attacked Kabamba Military Training School, hoping to collect more guns. The truck they used was driven by Andrew Lutaya. During the war that lasted five years, Museveni's guerrillas boasted of using the very government they were fighting as the main supplier of weapons. They all progressed with attacks on security installations to collect guns. Later in the year, meetings were held between Yuri Museveni and finally, his popular resistance army marched with Yusuf Lule's Uganda freedom fighters to form the National Resistance Army or Movement NRA. The chairman was Lule and Museveni was the overall military commander. The first army commander of the NRA was Ahmed Seguia, who did not live to the end of the war. Key NRA players on the external wing included lawyer Amama Mbabazi, Sam Munjuba, Eria Kategaya, and Dr. Samson Chiseka, who ran a large medical practice in Nairobi. Museveni's army grew as more young men, including highly educated ones, joined him. From Makere University came people like Mujisha Mutu, Aronda Nyakairima and Sirangaranga. From outside came others like Dr. Chiza Vesije, who was working in a Nairobi hospital, and lawyer Kale Kaihura, who had just completed his master's in law at London School of Economics. But the NRA did not hold territory at first, and it was highly mobile. In December 1983, the government chief of staff, Major General Oita Ojok, died in a helicopter crash as he supervised operations against Museveni's forces in Luero. This helped reduce the morale of the government army and boosting that of the rebels. In January 1985, exactly one year before the NRA captured power, its chairman Yusuf Lule died of kidney failure in England. Museveni assumed both the political leadership and the military command of NRM stroke NRA. On July 27th, 1985, the army overthrew Milton Obote. The junta, led by General Tito Okello, sued for peace and talks started in Nairobi between them and the NRA under the chairmanship of President Daniel Arab Moy. The talks lasted until December 17th, 1985, when the Nairobi Peace Agreement was signed by Yuri Museveni and Tito Okello. 
<laughs> However, its implementation required that atrocities by the Uganda army against the people stop. The Okelo lacked control over the unruly soldiers. The NRA moved and made a final assault of Kampala, declaring itself the new government on January 26, 1986, with Yuri Museveni as president. He had taken exactly the same period that Semogeli agreed to spend in opposition. Five years, Museven started putting together a broad-based government which pledged to rule for four years and organize general elections. Museveni's ascendance to power brought a lot of relief and jubilation in Kampala as Uganda prepared to start a new journey to peace and prosperity. How far have these been achieved? Now, as we near the conclusion of our series on the 1980 election that plunged the country into war, with a look at the key personalities that participated, we now look at candidate Yoweri Museveni, the man who led Uganda patriotic movement. What did he do after December 10th election? New Vision TV summarizes Museveni's post-election struggle. In the last part of our series on the aftermath of the 1980 election that plunged the country into war, we look at the post-war career of Yuri Museveni, who spent at Camp Thad in the polls after he successfully waged a five-year people's war. After capturing state power in January 1986, Museveni moved to form a broad-based government that included the political forces in the country, while political party activities were suspended and restricted restricted to their headquarters. Later that year, insurgents in the north started by remnants of the disbanded army. Later, Alice Laquena formed her Holy Spirit movement, which was to be succeeded by Joseph Kony's Lord's resistance army. But Museveni also faced a serious challenge of Kenya, whose business community and political leaders were worried that recovering Uganda spelled disaster of their manufacturing and transport sector that depended heavily on the Ugandan market. The two countries almost went to war in December 1987. The NRM pledged to stay in power for four years and organize general elections. The clock ticked very fast and January 1990 was approaching for the NRM term to end to give way to an elected government. The M70 government brought a motion to the interim legislature, which was chaired by Moses Chigonga Speaker on behalf of NRM Chairman Yoram Seveni, seeking a five-year extension in order to restore constitutional rule. As some members debated against the move, a historical NRC member, Gertrude Njuba, told them that the National Resistance Army had set up the NRC to formalize its wishes, and if the NRC didn't pass the extension, the NRA would still go ahead and do it. The extension was granted alongside an extension to the life of the legislature. Laws of making a new constitution were passed, including a constitution commission of collecting people's views and writing the draft, setting up an interim electoral commission, and creating the constituent assembly. In October 1995, the new constitution was promulgated. During the extension, Museveni's government achieved big steps in the economy, which got liberalized and privatized. Museveni also played the leading role in reviving the East African cooperation with his then counterparts Ali Hassan Mwinyi and Arab Moi of Tanzania and Kenya respectively, that led to the creation of the current East African community. In 1995, Uganda's first ever direct presidential elections were held and Museveni stood. His main challenger was Paulo Semogedere. Museveni won. Semogedere's chief campaign manager, Mariam Tagamba, crossed to Museveni's camp and became minister. In 2001, the second direct presidential elections were held. Museveni offered his candidature for the last time under the constitution which barred anybody who had served two terms from standing. His main challenger was Dr. Kizabesje, a Bushwa comrade and former personal physician. Museveni won. Besje petitioned the Supreme Court but lost on grounds that the irregularities in the elections were not enough to change the outcome of the election. 
In 2005, the constitution was amended by parliament to remove the presidential term limits. This cleared the way from seven to seek presidency again. He stood in 2006 and his main challenger was again Dr. Kiza Besje. Museven won and Bestia petitioned the Supreme Court. Other court found several irregularities, including the Electoral Commission failing to follow the law in conducting the election. The petition was dismissed. In 2011, Museven stood again and his main challenger was again Bestia. It was a peaceful election, but a lot of money was used, leading to inflation. Bank of Uganda governor to Musim Mtibria protested in the foreign press. Museveni won again. This time, Besje did not petition court, saying he no longer expects justice from the country's judiciary. Instead, he joined work to work protests that almost crippled the economy. He was assaulted several times and paper sprayed, getting hospitalized in Nairobi and narrowly surviving going blind. In 2016, Museveni stood again. A new entrant in the race was his long time colleague, Amama Mbabazi, who had also been Secretary General of the NRM and Prime Minister. New key players like Evelyn Anite came in on Museveni's side to neutralize Mbabazi's clout in the party. He was ejected from the executive. The campaign was tense, attempts to unite Mbabazi and Bestia failed, and in the end, Museveni won with Bestia again coming in as runner-up. Mbabazi couldn't even gain a 1.5 percent of the total votes cast. In 2017, the presidential candidate age limit of 75 years was removed from the constitution, paving way from 70 to keep standing if he wishes. The amendment was passed under unprecedented tension and violence in parliament. Security forces entered the chamber and fought with opposition legislators, inflicting several injuries on some of them, and they had to be treated in different healthy facilities. A new opponent emerged in the process. A young musician turned MP, Robert Chagulanyi, also known as Bobby Wine. Subsequent by-elections and elections to new constituencies have since become a battle between Chagulanyi and Museveni. The next presidential election is scheduled for 2021 and Museveni is likely to stand again, going by statements of his party members. Besje has indicated that he may not stand, while pressure is also mounting on Chagulani to stand. If this happens, it will be a battle of generations. This is the end of New Vision TV's 13-part series of the election that plunged Uganda into war and how it ended up rewriting the country's history. It gives pleasure to look back in time and relate with the current proceedings. Reporting for New Vision TV, I am Rothi Naseje.